For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the brink of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Jesus couldn't help but say something to his disciples, and so he directed their attention to the situation. And he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. And he gives a reason why. He says, they all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. Why? All she, had all, she gave all that she had to live on. She had a proper understanding of stewardship. By Webster's dictionary definition, a steward is one who simply manages another person's property. That's what a steward really is. What that means is that what we have is not our own. It's all owned by God and he's entrusted it to us that we might be merely stewards or managers of the goods that he's given to us. Now, God can choose to entrust us with as much as he wants or as little as he wants, but in no case whatsoever do we ever take ownership for it. It's not ours, it's his. What we have, we do not own, and we've never owned it. We've never owned it. Now, until we acknowledge God's total ownership, we really can't experience God's direction in financial management. So in Matthew chapter 6, 32 and 33, I'm going to share with you the, that verse in my own words. It's a familiar verse to many. It's God makes a promise to us and it says, if I put my priorities on seeking to live for Jesus today, then he will make it his priority to make provision for me today. It's just that simple. If I put God first, he'll take care of my needs just that simple. And it's a wonderful, wonderful promise. So I want you to notice something here. There is a prerequisite to the fulfillment of that particular promise. What's the prerequisite in the verse? Put God first in all things, right? That's the prerequisite. Then there's something else to consider here. And, and, and we'll get into this a little bit here in our message this morning. God expects certain minimums from us. He expects certain minimums. So there are prerequisites to the fulfillment of the promise and he also expects some minimums from us. And I'll explain that in just a moment. So of course, many of us have experienced financial challenges and they've caused a lot of frustrations and worrying. But God's plan provides peace and freedom. And those qualities show themselves in every aspect of a Christian's life. For example, the release of tension and worry, a clear conscience, and the sure knowledge that God is in control, that God is in control. This isn't to say that our lives won't be, uh, will, won't be financially trouble-free. We're humans. We're subject to making mistakes. Plus, we live in a very unpredictable world, things that we, we just didn't see coming around the corner. But here's the point. In, once we put God in charge of our finances, he, his divine control will bring this area of our finances back under control. So when we give it to him and put it in his control, then this area will come under control. Does that make sense? Certainly clear. God is good about that. Now, there are simple steps to achieving God's plan. For every promise God makes us, as I mentioned earlier, he has a prerequisite. And in, in many cases, he has some minimums, actions required to bring his power into focus in our lives. That might be prayer, that certainly might be expressing and living by faith. But there are some very practical things that God expects us to do as well. If you're seeking God's best in your life, then you, you must be willing to submit to his will and to his direction. There are many Christians who say they accept God's direction, but their actions actually deny it. They follow only when it's convenient to do so. We need to remember that God's will is not compatible with our wishes. In many cases, God's will is not compatible with our wishes. And so let's take a look at some of these practical things, these minimums that will certainly bring a sense of financial freedom. You may not have that issue here today, but you can certainly share these things with others that you do know. Some of you may be struggling, and here are these things for you. First of all, transfer your ownership to God. 
Transfer your ownership to God. It's all of his anyway. I'm going to read to you here Proverbs 3.19. The Lord by his wisdom hath founded the earth and by understanding he established the heavens. Everything is God's anyway. It's his. So this is a very important step. There's no substitute for this step. If you believe that you are the owner of even one single possession, then the ups and downs that you experience affecting your possessions will be reflected in your attitude. It will be reflected in your attitude. If, however, you made the transfer of all to the ownership of God, then you realize that whatever event comes your way, whatever up or down, God is moving providentially to accomplish his will in your life. And so we transfer ownership over to him. Number two, and you know this was coming, get out of debt and try to stay out of debt. A condition of debt exists when the following circumstances are true. Money, goods, and services are owed to other people with a payment past due. Also, if a calamity took place, there would be a negative balance in your bank account. Finances, financial responsibilities also produce anxiety. If any of these apply to you, then you're in debt. So what do you do to get out of debt? Well, evaluate every purchase before you're buying it. Proverbs 18, 15 says, the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So ask good questions before you make a particular purchase. Does it enhance God's work through you? Is it necessary? Can you do it? Can you do without it? Now that's a very important question, isn't it? Can I actually do without it? Is it best, is it the best possible buy? Does it add to the family relationship? Will it depreciate quickly? What will it what will its upkeep cost? Will it be expensive to upkeep that thing? And so evaluate every purchase. Number two, use a written budget. It's kind of old fashioned, but I tell you what, I tell you what, listen to what the wise man says here in Proverbs 16, 9. He says, better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And so maybe you want to have a written budget, put things down on paper, live within your means, and then buy on a cash basis where possible. Of course, not always possible to do for a house, not always possible to do for a car, but you want to pay those things down as quickly as possible. The Bible says in Romans 13, 8, owe man nothing except to love one another. And I think we should live by those, that standard. And lastly, practice saving money regularly. Proverbs 21, 20 says, there is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. However, a foolish man squanders it. And so we ought to get in the practice of money, saving money regularly. By the way, have you heard of Billings Law? Have any of you heard of Billings Law? Now, I want you to forget it after I've told it to you, but I just thought I'd share it with you because it does bring a smile to your face. face. Billings Law says, live within your income, even if you have to borrow to do so. Now, we don't want to live by that way for sure. All right, so get out of debt as quickly and as fast as possible. Stay out of debt. Number three, accept God's provision or direction rather. Accept God's direction. Worry will disappear when we accept God's direction. We need to believe that his wisdom is superior to ours, that he does care about our every need. I love what it says in Psalm 127 verse 2. It's vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows. For he gives his beloved sleep. Isn't that a beautiful promise? We don't have to stay up late worrying. We don't have to get up early fretting. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be thrifty and get up and get going for the day. But we ought not worry about those things. God gives his beloved sleep. So accept God's direction. Also, refuse to make quick decisions. We live in a, in a do it now society. Buy it now, get it now. And uh, uh, one of the premises of, of course, get rich quick schemes is that they require quick decisions based on incomplete information. Don't be swindled by a slick talking salesman. Don't make quick decisions. Proverbs 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. Refuse to make quick decisions. Also, excel in your work. Excel in your work. It's impossible to be, to be slack if excellence is the minimum standard that you're living by. And I hope we live by the standard of excellence because we live for God. Too often Christians think that they should give second, uh, be second best or purposefully fail so they're not on top. But that's not God's plan. I want you to listen to these words from 1 Peter 4.11. 
He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So give your best. Excel in your work. Can you say amen out there? All right. And then there's another step, confession and restitution. God tells us to put things in the past in the past. But often that requires making restitution to the offended party. The lessons learned and the blessings received, of course, will be uh, great and worth of the, worthy of the sacrifice. The Bible considers, God considers deceitfulness and dishonesty as abominations. And therefore, we should make every effort to escape their snare. You remember the story in Luke 19? a uh, young tax collector, or at least a short tax collector, by the name of Zacchaeus, who climbed that sycamore tree. Luke 19 tells us that salvation came to Zacchaeus' house when he had returned what he had stolen with interest and gave half his goods to the needy. So confession and restitution is certainly an important part, integral part of experiencing financial freedom. The next one is contentment. Contentment, greediness, covetousness come as a result of discontentment. To overcome those attitudes, we just need to simply seek contentment in a moderate lifestyle. A moderate lifestyle. Now, for some, that may be difficult to adjust to. Others, not so much. But you cannot have peace financially unless you're willing to live a moderate lifestyle. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this know... That no fornicator, unclean person, covetous man who is an idolater has the, will inherit the kingdom of God. So experience contentment. Also, provide for your family needs. Now, I know that's very, very obvious. But for some, it's not so obvious. This is principle should be self-evident. If the family is going without basic needs, it is your responsibility as a provider for the home to provide for their needs. Period. So to do so may require some to curtail their lifestyle or their fulfillment of their wants and desires. They've always wanted this, they've always wanted that. You may not be actually able to have that. Might have to cut the cable bill. Might have to do without the data on your cell phone to provide adequately for your family's needs. You fill in the blanks. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So provide for your family. And then balanced commitments. You know, an imbalanced life, and I, I know this all too well, leads to frustration and eventual problems. And that's particularly true of overwork. There are a lot of Christian individuals who sacrifice their families and their personal relationships with Christ, and they rationalize it by simply trying to give money to both. It doesn't work that way. God wants us first, not our money. He wants us first. Families need fathers, not investors. So seek the balance God requires. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 says, Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. And oh, how so true that is. Balanced commitments. Also, sacrifice desires. Sacrifice desires. God doesn't look fondly on commitment to possessions. Some even suggest it's a sin, a commitment, a dedication to possessions, things that we can never let go. Now, that doesn't mean God wants for us to live in poverty, but neither does it mean that we should be swayed by corporate America and their skilled marketing campaigns. God does not expect, God expects us rather to live less extravagantly and not be tricked by tantalizing offers. You see, King Solomon had done it all, he'd seen it all, he had it all, and in the end, he said, what did he say there in Ecclesiastes 10, 2 verses 10 and 11? It was all vanity. And then lastly, accept God's provision. Accept God's provision for you. God never promises equality in provision. Deuteronomy 15, 11 says, for the poor will never cease out of the land. But he does promise that our needs might be met. And sometimes it comes through the abundance of other individuals. Therefore, every Christian, you and I, we have a role in God's plan. And we must be willing to accept God's provision without resentment. 
without bitterness. Luke 3.14 tells us, this is John the Baptist, he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Be content with your wages. Friends, money problems can be avoided when we invest our resources in the things of eternity. When we consider that there is more to life than these just these few years that we experience here and that there is an eternity that stretches way beyond. And it gives us, when we consider it that way, it gives us a proper perspective of how to manage our affairs here and now. It helps us place a right value on stuff right here, right now. If we're living for the present, really it just betrays a narrow vision. Loading up and living for ourselves, of course, won't do us any good when it's all said and done. You've heard the saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. Well, someone more perceptively changed the line to, he who dies with the most toys still dies. The things of this earth are temporary, plain and simple. And I say, take the world, but give me Jesus. What do you say out there? I want to close by sharing with you a story. It's one of my favorite stories. Some of you may be familiar with this story. As I share it, you, and you know the story, you'll, you'll know what I'm referring to. It's about ownership, about giving God ownership of all that we have. Otto Conning, Otto Conning was a missionary in New Guinea. Uh, that's that big island that's kind of divided in half just above Australia. It's the second largest island in the globe next to Greenland, I believe. He worked among the native tribes there that had known only their village ways. As a matter of fact, one of the village ways was stealing from others. These were chronic thieves. They couldn't help themselves but steal. So when Otto and his wife arrived and they moved into their hut, the natives often came by to visit. The Connings would notice that after the natives left their missionary home, <clears throat> the various household items had gone walking. They just disappeared. They didn't see those items again until they went into the native's village to do some shopping and to talk with the folk. On one particular time, they saw a lady. She had a necklace around her neck, and at the bottom of it was attached a can opener. They'd been looking for that thing for weeks, cracking cans open with knives and machetes. Another time, after searching for their child's diaper bobby pins, they spotted them hanging from the ears of one of the villagers. The natives would call Otto and his wife the long-nosed white people. And what that meant in their uh, dialect and language, long nose meant stingy. Stingy. One man tried to sell Otto a fish while wearing Otto's T-shirt. The nerve. Now, Otto, he also had a cardboard box. And he, when he would go into the village to minister to the people, he'd take the, the box with him. And when he was in there learning the language and culture and ministering to them, he would go to their homes. And when he was in the homes, he would gather up all his belongings that they had stolen. He was known as the missionary with the box. And he really didn't like to be known about that. But how else was he supposed to get his stuff back? The natives would often tell him he was always angry. Otto, you're always angry. And he would respond, I was never angry until I met you people. I could be a good missionary if it wasn't for you. Well, the only fruit that Otto could grow on the island because of its sandy uh, texture, sandy soil, was pineapples. He would grow pineapples. He liked pineapples. And, um, and he would grow those pineapples. And when they would get ripe, the natives there in that area, in that village, would steal them. Otto never could get a ripe pineapple for himself. He'd eye one in the corner of the garden. He knew that was the one he was going to take home. Before he could get to it, it was gone. He could never have a ripe pineapple all for himself. One day he decided he was going to close up the medical clinic. His wife ran. because he, And he told them, if you want pills, then you're going to have to leave my pineapples alone. You're going to have to leave them alone. Well, that didn't work. Some of the villagers even let some of their children die. Uh, before they would stop stealing. So they'd opened up the, the clinic again. Another time, they decided to close the trade store where the villagers would come for fish hooks and matches and the like. That didn't work because the villagers decided they didn't want to live by, next to stingy people anymore, the stingy white man. And so they moved away. So he opened it back up and then they came back. The natives continued to steal Otto's pineapples. The more they stole, the angrier he became. And finally, one day Otto had a German shepherd dog flown in from another mission, missionary to protect his pineapples garden after one frustrating experience after another had failed. This further alienated 
uh, the natives from him. They wouldn't come by the mission station anymore. And if they did come, they would crowd inside the medical clinic where Otto's wife worked when the dog was loose. The people who came in on stretches, sick as dogs, ended up running home when they saw that dog. Finally, they realized they had to get rid of the dog. One time, Otto put a stake in the ground in his pineapple garden. He told them that the pineapples on this side are mine, the pineapples on this side, they are yours. Do not touch those on this side. Well, they still came over to his side and stole his pineapples. They believed that they, because he had hired them to plant the pineapples in their minds, they had thought that the pineapples were theirs. Otto would try to correct them, but they wouldn't have anything to do, to do with it. When they realized Otto saw things very differently, they said to him that they always wondered why he got all bent out of shape and impatient over something that was never his anyway. Of course, they were his. Otto took furlough to the United States. And while he was in the United States, he went to a conference in Illinois on personal rights. At the conference, Otto discovered that he was frustrated over this situation, the pineapple garden, because he had taken personal rights ownership of his pineapple garden. The speaker to the audience would tell the audience, give your possessions to God. God can take better care of your property than you can take care of it. So after a lot of soul searching, Otto decided that he would give his pineapple garden to God. God's pineapples that grew actually were bigger and better than Otto's. God knew how to take care of Otto's or at least God's pineapple garden better than Otto did. But Otto would still get angry because the natives came in still to steal those pineapples. He'd been doing it for seven years, so it was hard to give his anger up. He would pray about it, surrender it, but then found himself getting angry again because they were stealing God's pineapples. And he would even remind God, and he would notice a villager in the, in the pineapple garden. He'd say, God, one of these villagers are in your pineapple garden. Just letting you know, in case you didn't know, they're there, they're going to steal your pineapples. Eventually, Otto was able to let the whole thing go. He let the whole thing go. And one day, one of the natives said to Otto, you must have become a Christian. And Otto said, why do you say that? And they, he said, because you don't get angry anymore. We always wondered if we would ever meet a Christian. Otto was broken in spirit. He'd been there seven years. And he realized he'd never expressed the Christianity he was teaching to the villagers all along. They asked him why he doesn't get angry anymore. He told them that he'd given his pineapple garden away. One of the men asked him uh, who he'd given the pineapple garden away to. But Otto, he didn't want to tell him. He told him, I'll tell you in the morning. He was so devastated by what had just happened and how he'd been a poor witness. And this really bothered the men of the village. How could they steal pineapples from someone, from the, from someone they, didn't know who, they didn't know who owned them? How could they steal them? The next morning, morning, all the men of the village gathered around Otto's home. They'd been out all throughout the night in their village. They'd gone to other villages to find out who Otto had given his pineapple garden to. They couldn't rest. And now they found their way back to Otto's house. They only had one question when Otto and his wife came out to meet them. Otto, who did you give your pineapple garden to? So Otto told them that he had given them to the God in heaven. He'd given them to the God in heaven. They rubbed their noses because in that culture, that's how they think. They rubbed their noses. And then they asked, Otto, does God not have pineapples in heaven? And Otto said, I'm not sure. Then they asked, how many moons ago did you, Otto, did you give these pineapples to God? And Otto said, about five to six moons ago. The men started talking among themselves and then talking, the talking got louder and louder. And there was a lot of excitement and some very big concern generating in that discussion. And finally, finally they told Otto, you've got to go into your house. You've got to get on your knees and you've got to tell your God to ask for your pineapple garden back. But Otto was happy now, not owning his garden. Uh, he, he, he didn't want to do that, and he couldn't do that. They begged him, Otto, go in, pray to your God, ask for the pineapple garden back. You see, they realized that his giving his garden to God was the source of all of the problems they were then having in their village. 
They had meeting after meeting to figure out what the problem was. They met with their witch doctor to figure out what the problem was. They paid, prayed to their pagan gods to figure out what the problem was and they still couldn't figure out what the problem was. You see, after Otto had given his pineapple garden to God, everything started to go wrong for the villagers because they were touching God's pineapples and he could take better care of his own pineapples than Otto could. The rain wouldn't fall, the gardens would not grow, they would let their fish hooks down into the river and they wouldn't catch anything. They would hunt for animals, they could not catch anything. Their women couldn't even get pregnant and they were afraid that the neighboring tribes would grow bigger and bigger, becoming a greater threat to their own tribe. Everything had gone wrong. And now they knew what the source of the problem was and they demanded Otter to go back into his house and ask his God for, for his garden back. Well, Otto couldn't do that. And finally, one of the influential villagers told the people that it was time to stop sit stealing. His God is a big God. His God is a big God. And eventually, not right away, eventually everyone would stop stealing. And you know, after all this time, Otto witnessed his first conversion. And many began coming to Christ once he fully gave his garden to God. The fruit grew, grew so abundant that Otto began exporting it to other missionary stations and around the place and growing all types of other fruit that he couldn't grow before, even bananas. His village became the most evangelized in the whole region. Otto realized something that each one of us also must realize. He never really owned his possessions anyway. God did. They're all God's. Now, even though Otto's pineapple garden belonged to God, Otto still had to weed it. He still had to go out and water it. He still had to go harvest the fruit. That was his responsibility. But now he wasn't the owner of it. He was simply the manager of it. God was the owner. And friends, it's the same thing with you and with me. What we have is God's friends. We have never, ever really owned our possessions. And you really don't need to. Perhaps there are some here today that need to recognize that true that need to recognize that and they truly need to turn all over into the safekeeping hands of God. God asks us to put in his hands what actually already belongs to him. And so will you do that today? Will you keep doing that? When we do this, even though there might be money challenges along the way, God is in charge. And he knows how to best take care of his things that he has entrusted to you. God bless you today, my friends. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.